Great. Well, thank you so much, John. Uh, really appreciate the introduction and uh, also the invitation. I've really enjoyed my visit so far. And um, I just you know, want to say what a real privilege, privilege is, it is to be at Santa Barbara, where there's been so much seminal work that's been done on electronic materials over the years. And you know, of course, that continues to this, this very day. Uh, can everyone hear me all right? OK. Just, um, and again, you know, if, if, if any of you have questions in the middle of the talk, please, please feel free to just to stop me and, and, and ask. Um, let me tell you about some of the work that we've been doing in my group over the last uh, couple of years or so, where we use photo emission spectroscopy primarily, that's the sort of shining light aspect of this talk, um, to probe the uh, electronic structure and interactions in a variety of different kinds of uh, quantum materials. And uh, in particular, one of the systems we've been really focusing is on our uh, sort of artificial heterostructures, these correlated materials. So here is a sort of a little artist, or well, actually graduate student's rendition of a you know, very, very thin film of uh, one of these trans correlated transition metal oxides. It's, you know, and there's some interesting changes in the properties as you make them very thin, sort of below a nanometer sort of in thickness. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that work. But sort of, you know, starting from the sort of very big picture motivation for why quantum materials are interesting and, and, and important. You know, there's just a vast number of very interesting emerging properties like superconductivity, uh, you know, uh, electron fractionalization. Recently, in the last few years, there's been a tremendous amount of excitement in looking at topological states of matter. And one thing I really want to emphasize is that you know, it doesn't look like we're done yet. There's, there's a lot of you know, unexplored territory that's still you know, yet to be discovered. A lot of theoretical proposals, many of which actually uh, uh, originate from work here at Santa Barbara. Uh, you know, in the groups of like Leon Balance and, and, and Matthew Fisher and Shu, where you know, we're looking, com you know, proposing new correlated topological states or different kinds of spin liquids or uh, emergent magnetic monopoles and things like that. So there's a lot of things that are out there that are still yet to be discovered that's, that makes this field so rich and exciting. Um, so in general, one of the hallmarks of these correlated quantum materials is that they have very complex phase diagrams. So basically, you know, they have competing interactions, and what that means is that you, know, you have these complex phase diagrams where there's many different kind of competing ground states. And in recent years, a lot of people have been very excited with the possibility of basically, you know, for instance, trying to park yourself at the boundary between one of these phases and using a small perturbation to kick oneself from one side of the phase di diagram to another. So, you know, in analogy to that, to let's say a transistor where you basically are just switching between an insulator and a metal, here you might be able to imagine switching from, you know, uh, an antiferromagnet to a superconductor or a ferromagnet to a charge ordered state. So you know, these sort of small, potentially small perturbations could, could, could give rise to large changes in properties. Uh, so uh, as a result, you know, a lot of people have been interested in trying to exploit a lot of these different phases that show up in these kinds of systems for potential different kinds of applications. So you have all these different kinds of properties, which I'll get back to a little bit later. And one, one thing to, to mention is that there are a lot of possible materials uh, you know, that basically exhibit all these different phenomena. Now, I think silicon is not in danger of being replaced by any, any materials on this list anytime soon. But at least if you're taking a long view, it's nice that there's this possibility that a lot of these uh, material systems have some, you know, potential uh, utility, at least, you know, maybe someday far in the future. So, uh, you know, uh, my, my interest is not so much on the device end, but just from the fundamental physics standpoint. And we're interested in basically what gives rise to all these different kinds of phenomena. So I'll start with basically this, you know, many-body Hamiltonian that you probably learned about in maybe like your second or third semester quantum mechanic class. And, you know, basically this is just the Hamiltonian non-relativistic one for interacting electrons and nuclei. And, uh, you know, probably the first thing you learn about it, it's basically impossible to solve for anything more than just a handful of particles, right? So trying to directly attack this problem just by solving this is, is, is more or less intractable. So we come up with different kinds of approximations to deal with them. And, and you know, this is why this many-body problem is still a very challenging unsolved problem. So you know, one particular tack you can take is basically to start with the electrons as more or less independent particles. So basically here you're treating the electron kinetic energy as the dominant term. And you can add in the other interactions kind of more in a you know, perturbative fashion, if you will. And so this is you know, more or less the, the underpinnings of you know, the idea behind modern band structure to, to these days, right? So, you know, I guess we're, we're in the building, you know, named after the founder of sort of, you know, modern band structure and density functional theory. Uh, so, you know, that, this is basically, you know, we're starting from this kind of limit. So you can take the opposite viewpoint where the electron interactions are the dominant term, and there, you know, to minimize Coulomb repulsions, you basically would, you know, want to form some electron crystal, if you will, just to minimize the, the Coulomb repulsions. Uh, 
And the kinds of systems that we're really interested in are ones where basically these, these interactions are more or less on an equal footing. So instead of you know, starting from one limit or the other, you know, these are basically, you know, let's say, very comparable interactions. So what you end up with is a sort of very highly entangled many-body state, which is very difficult to compute uh, you know, from a theoretical standpoint. But that's also what gives rise to all these very interesting and exotic properties that we're interested in, in looking, looking at. So what we really want are material systems where these kind of two interactions are more or less balanced. And um, there's a, a large family of systems where this is the case. These are so-called transition metal oxides. So, so why yes. are you getting, please, Oh, well, that's, yeah. If I were in your space, I would say that's important. Yes, that, that, is, that is extremely important. Uh, you know, usually that's not as large, at, happening at as large an energy scale as the electron, uh, uh, the kinetic energy, which is, you know, m m electron, these are talking about electron volts, and usually, you know, the electron photon interactions are sort of in the, you know, 50 or, you know, hundreds of milli electron volts. But as I'll show you actually in a few slides, you know, we have a lot of systems where, the low energy physics is, you know, the electron photon interaction is very important. I'll show you actually a little bit of how we can use photo emission to directly probe those interactions. But those are kind of the, usually the, the two sort of traditional limits at w in which, you know, one starts, and then you add in these, these terms, you know. So, for instance, when you treat the electron photon interaction, you start with an electron gas and you add in, you know, the electron photon interactions and, you know, by adding certain Feynman diagrams in and things like that. Does that answer your question? More or less? Okay. But I'll, I'll kick it down the road for a few slides. Are there any other questions at this point? All right, so uh, the transition metal oxides are a very nice uh, uh, family of systems to basically where, where these interactions are more or less on, a, on an equal footing. So, you know, the large Coulomb repulsion comes from the, the, these 3D orbitals. There's a fairly small spatial extent. And there's a relatively large Coulomb penalty to doubly occupy the, the 3D orbitals. And then the uh, electron kinetic energy term comes from these large fat oxygen 2p orbitals, which basically provide you know, a, a strong hybridization from site to site. So basically the hopping is made possible by these oxygen 2p orbitals. That's the oxide part. And the transition metal basically provides the, the, the large uh, Coulomb interactions. Okay? So you know, in, this, you know, in this family of systems, there are just many, many different kinds of uh, physical properties that one can come up with. So, you know, high temperature superconductivity, colossal magnesium resistance, all kinds of exotic magnetism, multiferroicity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, you know, that, that's obviously tremendously exciting. From a very practical standpoint, which, you know, I'm not so worried about, but, you know, I think, if in, again, taking the long view, if anyone wants to do anything useful with these, many of these elements are very abundant in the Earth's crust. So if you actually wanted to make some kind of technology, it's not inconceivable that you could actually do this. You know, we're not talking about like plutonium, plutonium or osmium or something like that, you know, something much more exotic. And finally, one thing that's quite important is that most of these compounds share a very common structural motif. So most of them basically form this so-called cubic perovskite structure where you basically have a transition metal embedded inside these, this oxygen octahedra here, this cage, and there's basically a rare earth cation here that you can basically swap out. And so the really interesting thing is that in this one sort of structural unit, just by switching out the transition metal or switching out the cation, you can dial through all these properties. Okay? So there's a huge amount of tunability that is bas basically available to you. And so you know, even in bulk single crystals, just by, you know, like I said, you know, playing with the chemistry, you can dial through all these properties. That's very powerful. Another thing that I'll get to a little bit later and this is, of course, something that's, I think, very familiar to this audience, you know, at Santa Barbara, is, you know, using interfaces. So now you can, you know, you can take this cube, uh, this sort of, uh, uh, this, this structural unit, this common structural unit to your advantage. You can grow these materials basically cube on cube. And you can basically make, you know, very nice atomic interfaces and play with a lot of the games that, for instance, you know, people have pioneered here where you can break, break the symmetry at the interface or use lower dimensionality band offsets and things like that. You know, those are additional tuning parameters one can use. So I'll get back to this a little bit later. At this point, I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about some of the tools that we use to look at the interactions uh, and electronic structure in these systems and hopefully answer, answer your question in more detail. Um, so we basically use angle resolve photo emission spectroscopy. This is basically nothing other than just the photoelectric effect. So you've heard, if you've heard of the photoelectric effect, which I'm sure everyone has, then you know, basically that is, that is basically what we do. We come in with a beam of, of, of uh, monochromatic photons, and we have uh, an electron spectrometer that maps out the speed and direction with which the electrons are basically uh, ejected from the crystal. 
And so, you know, all it's doing is just measuring the speed and direction of the electrons. If we know what its orientation is relative to the crystal axes, then we can just use some very simple energy and momentum conservation relationships to basically just back out, you know, the energy and momentum quantum number, uh, quantum numbers of the electron when it was in the solid. Okay, so that's you know basically what we're most interested in, and we can get at this very directly using this technique. So I'll start off with a very simple example. Uh, that being, you know, let's imagine we just have electrons that are just trapped in two dimensions. So let's say they're just, you know, sitting on the surface of, of some material, a 2D electron gas. So, you know, your energy versus momentum dispersion relationship is going to be E is, you know, P squared over 2M. And so if they're trapped in two dimensions, you'll just get this 2D par paraboloid. And so, you know, your energy versus momentum dispersion, you know, in, in one dimension will basically just be a parabola. And your Fermi surface will just be a circular ring, right? So I think... Everyone learns about this in, I guess, like the first couple of weeks of your solid state course. Uh, and it turns out there's actually quite a few systems out there that do support these 2D electron gases that live at surfaces. Um, so particularly, this is some measurements that my student John did a couple years back. So we're measuring the electron accumulation layer of a, on, on academium oxide surface. And so you see a nice kind of circular Fermi surface. The intensity is modulated by some matrix elements, but don't worry about that too much. But basically, you know, it looks like a nice Fermi surface looks like a nice circle. What I'm showing here is basically the intensity we're measuring. False color represents the number of electrons we're measuring at any given uh, momenta. And this is a cut taken at a constant energy, right at the Fermi level. Okay? And then if I look in sort of energy versus momentum, then I get a sort of nice you know, parabola, parabolic-like dispersion. That you know, basically works more or less as advertised. We weren't so interested in this surface in of itself. We were actually using it as a test for a new elect, uh, photon uh, source that we had built in the lab. So it was just sort of a nice vanilla test of our, of our instrumentation. OK. What determines why the lower parts of the parabola are kind of washed out? Yeah. yeah, so there's some photoelectron matrix elements. Uh, so basically, when you, when you extract the electron, it's a, there's a, basically a dipole transition that's being made. So uh, depending on the symmetry of the orbital, oftentimes you'll, you'll basically uh, lose intensity right in, 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 you know, at, for instance, at, at a high symmetry point. Another possibility, and I'll get into this in about two slides, is that, of course, the lifetime of your excitations uh, decreases, you know, the further away you get from the Fermi level, because this, you know, Fermi liquid theory, so you basically get increased scattering rates. So I'll talk a little bit about that, and also about electron-phonon coupling in a, in a couple slides. Is that, uh, okay. So, um, so like I said, we want to employ this not to look at just 2D electron gases at surfaces, but also at you know, correlated electronic states. Um, and it turns out there's a nice sort of built-in formalism for interpreting this. So instead of having sort of you know, infinitely long-lived excitations, in reality, due to interactions, you know, when we make excitations in solids, they have some finite lifetime due to many-body interactions. So when you, you know, pluck an electron out, it has some probability to decay when it's in the solid. It's an interacting system, so it really makes sense to talk about sort of, you know, a Green's function for the system. And it turns out that the photo emission intensity can be written as a function of a bunch of things, like this matrix element that I just uh, alluded to, this dipole matrix element, you know, a Fermi function, because we're looking at the occupied states. And it's AK of omega. That's our single particle spectral function. It's basically just an imaginary part of the electron's Green's function in the system. So basically what we're doing now, so that it can be written like this, and there's a sigma, that, which is just the, the self-energy, which encodes all the information about the interactions. It's kind of like a kernel in this expression that encodes all the interactions. So for instance, now if you look at a system with stronger interactions, so this is, uh, and this is maybe getting, getting to answer your question is, so we're going to look at a system with a, that's a Fermi liquid, so it has sort of moderate electron-electron interactions. So again, uh, this is sort of this is about the accumulation of about 10 to the four different spectra. We kind of uh, 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 basically assemble it in kind of a wedge like this. So basically, if you look at this top surface here, that's uh, intensity, uh, false colors intensity at one energy, the Fermi level, as a function of the in-plane momenta. Okay, so that's basically that's basically representing our Fermi surface. Our Fermi surface is made of these basically intersecting circles that you see here. Okay. Uh, and then if I look at the intensity along one of these vertical faces, that's basically E versus K, so that's basically a band dispersion. And so what you'll notice if we look down here near the bottom of this wedge, things look kind of blurry and indistinct. And, uh, you know, so basically if you make an excitation down here, it's not very long-lived. But as we sweep through this wedge and go up towards the Fermi level, you'll notice that our excitations get sharper and sharper and very well-defined. 
right when we approach the Fermi level. So that's basically a nice illustration of this idea behind, you know, Landau Fermi liquid quasi-particles. That your excitations are only really sharp and distinct when you get right up to the Fermi level where your phase space for scattering, you know, drops to zero. Um, so if we want to actually quantify our interactions a little bit more, you know, looking at things like electron-electron uh, interactions or electron-photon interactions. So we can start again with the simple, you know, E is just P squared over 2M. So the curvature of our band is more or less, you know, directly uh, proportional, inversely proportional to the effective mass of the electrons. So in reality, if we have some interactions which basically dress the electrons and make them effectively heavier, then, you know, in a sort of naive picture, you'll just flatten out your band, okay? And basically, for instance, you can look at the change in the slope here as more or less a, you know, a, a mass renormalization. So the Basically, the, the, the shallower your slope, the heavier, the heavier the effective mass. Now, you want to compare this to something without interactions, and that's, of course, hard to do. So typically, what we do is we compare that with, let's say, a density functional theory calculation, which doesn't treat the, uh, at least the on-site interactions in, 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 um, you know, in, 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 a, in a precise way. So for instance, uh, we've looked at a bunch of different systems. This is the work of, of Phil King, and I'll get back. Uh, he was a former postdoc in my group. I'll talk about this a little bit uh, near to the end of the talk. But basically, you know, this is lanthanum nickel 3 It's one of these correlated materials. And so this is the density functional theory calculation. So you can see this is the band. And you can see our band is actually much, much narrower than, than what it appears, you know, what the prediction is. So in fact, if you just, you know, uh, uh, basically just squish this parabola up by about a, roughly a factor of uh, seven, then actually you get very nice agreement with the uh, measured experimental band. Uh, and so, you know, in a very naive way, we would get an effective mass enhancement, about a factor of seven. It turns out that's actually very close to what you get from comparing uh, the effective mass from, let's say, uh, a, a specific heat measurements or optical measurements of the effective mass. So it seems to agree pretty well with, with other probes. If you want to be a little more quantitative and say, well, is this really due to Fermi liquid interactions, you can basically look at the, at the line shape a little more quantitatively, try to extract out the energy dependence to the scattering rate, and it, you know, does, it follows an omega squared dependence, you know, not, not so badly. So that's the green line over here. Okay, and that's basically what you, uh, if you're probably familiar that Fermi liquids have a T squared scattering rate in the resistivity, and that also translates to an omega squared scattering rate um, in the energy dependence. So that, to answer this question about the electron-phonon interaction, so of course electrons can interact with, with phonons very strongly. This, of course, drives conventional superconductivity in BCS uh, superconductors. This is some work done by uh, Danny Shea, who's just about to graduate from my group. And here we're looking at strontium ruthenium O3. It's another one of these correlated oxides. And what I want to turn your attention to is basically, if you look at this band right here, you can see actually right about here, it kind of suddenly turns over very abruptly. Uh, and oh no, you're missing my explanation of the electron phonon interaction. <laughs> All right. Uh, but uh, okay. Uh, but anyway, you can see it just it just it, it, it kinks over very abruptly, and then you can see that uh, actually, um, you know, actually so it deviates from this sort of nice uh, smooth line that you expect from band structure, right? So you can see this this kind of little wiggle right about here, right around 60 or 70 milli electron volts, okay? And so I'm, I'm, I'm sure you all remember page 521 from Ashcroft and Merman. Uh, uh, so I'm at, I'm at Cornell, so we have to. Uh, otherwise, <laughs> they, they, they will um, you know, turn off your ID card. Um, but if, yeah, so if you look at page 521 of Ashcroft and Merman, you basically see that actually, you see the, the band dispersion. You know, and basically, if you have an electron-phonon interaction, within basically the phonon energy, your, your band will basically have this little kink here. And that's almost, you know, that's almost exactly what we see here, right? So there's a, it's, it's you know, so this is sort of a nice textbook uh, uh, demonstration of, you know, what electron phonon interactions can do in these materials. One thing that was quite interesting was before Danny's work, people had suspected that this, so this, this, this change in the slope basically can be related to the electron phonon coupling and the mass enhancement, which we measured to be about a factor of four, which is very consistent with some other probes. And people previously had suspected that that was mainly due to electron-electron interactions. And so one thing that's really powerful about the kinds of experiments we're doing here is that you know, we can say, oh, well, actually, you know, the electron-electron interactions look relatively weak. It's, in fact, the electron-phonon interactions that are actually causing this large mass enhancement. And if you want to be a little more quantitative, you can also, like in the case of I showed you for the Fermi liquid, extract out the scattering rate as a function of energy. And you can see here it kind of you know, goes up and then like plateaus. And that's a very sort of characteristic hallmark of electron-phonon interactions, but you know different than the sort of continuous omega-squared dependence that we saw in the Fermi liquid. Yes. Uh, 
Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Uh, so basically, one thing uh, about the electron-electron interactions is that basically they should persist over the entire band. Okay? So, yeah, but that's usually very high, you know. Yeah, so, so basically what we can do here, so if I look uh, at this example here, right, you see basically there's a global renormalization of the band. There's a, and basically this, this omega squared depend, scattering rate actually goes up to, to fairly high energies, right? So here, if we actually compare the band dispersion, for instance, then what you would expect, and we've seen this in other systems that have actually a little bit stronger electron-electron interactions, is that the, the high energy part of the dispersion also gets renormalized a fair amount. And so what we find is that actually this, uh, the high energy part of this dispersion actually agrees quite well with DFT calculations for, for this particular material. So in that case, we think the electron-electron interactions in this case are not you know, particularly strong for this compound. Yeah, that's right, that's right. And we know there's optical phonons right at that energy range in this material, so. Um, that's really just a, this abrupt, you know, kink in the dispersion that is very sort of emblematic of, of electron-phonon interactions. Well, I think for this, for this material, we, you know, we haven't really put uh, a very, very precise bound on it. But you know, I would say you know, the, the majority, probably 70-80% of the mass renormalization, at least for this particular band, is probably coming from electron-phonon interactions and not from electron-electron. Whereas in the case of the lanthanum nicolate, it looks like it was almost wholly from electron-electron interactions. So, okay. Uh, and then you know, another, another thing here is that if we had omega squared, it, you know, it, it, Another thing we could extract is so if you look here, this basically scattering basically hits the photon energy, basically flattens out. And in other systems where the electron electron interaction is a little bit stronger, but you also have electron phonons, you'll see this jump up, and then it'll continue going up with this omega squared to slightly higher energies. Okay, all right, maybe we could yeah I'll talk a little bit later. So um, so this kind of picture is a little bit like you have a you know a boson at a certain frequency, and the band crosses it. You know, it kind of, you can think of it sort of hybridizes, if you will, and at low energies you form some kind of, let's say, a large polaron state. Um, so you can ask, well, can you get the same thing, let's say, if I just cross two bands with one another, right? And, and uh, of course, one can do this. So this is the case for, you know, in heavy fermion systems where you basically have F levels and a band, and basically they hybridize, and that, that gives rise, this hybridization, the change in the band curvature basically gives rise to the sort of the heaviness in the heavy fermions. And the, basically, these are systems that have uh, large local, localized 4F or 5F moments. So this is uranium ruthenium silicide. And um, so this is the work of one of my students, Shavik Chatterjee, and we got samples from uh, Graham Luke at McMaster. And just, you know, in case any of you ever plan on working on this material, um, uh, you should be very careful what you call this to the customs agent if you're bringing it into a different country. Uh, so they, they, they don't care that it's depleted uranium. Uh, they just, yeah, when they hear uranium, they're not that, that excited. Uh, to let you into their country. So these experiments are actually done in, in one of the synchrotrons in, in Germany. And so basically, uh, you know, at 20 K you see these bands, and then what happened was that when we, get down, when we got down to very low temperatures, at around 2 Kelvin, you can see the, the, the band suddenly sort of kink over again, sort of like I showed you in this electron phonon case. And actually you can't see it at this, at this particular photon energy, but at other photon energy you can see the, the F levels. They actually sit, there's some states that sit right around near the Fermi level. And so the picture is that around 20K, you have these ruthenium 4D bands that are the red ones, and then some localized uh, uranium moments. And then at low temperatures, so, so, so you know, sort of at high temperatures, they're kind of, uh, you have these localized moments, and you have these 4D electrons, and they're kind of each minding their own business. They're not talking to each other. And at low temperatures, basically, they, they start to hybridize and then, you know, form this very heavy effective mass state, which is basically what we're seeing over here. So this is, instead of basically, you know, uh, a, uh, a band crossing, let's say, a, pho a phonon brand. It's basically two bands crossing one another and hybridizing and picking up this large effective mass. So we can, you know, using this technique, really very subtly distinguish between different sort of interaction uh, coupling mechanisms. And so for those of you f familiar with condo physics, this is basically sort of a, a condo lattice kind of a problem. So, so mm -hmm. the conversion, that's, very, that's, very that's right, that's right, that's right, yeah. So it turns out that there's a lot of crystal field split for F states. And so there's just some that actually sit right near, right, very, very close to the Fermi level. And actually, at some different photon energies, you can you can really see them very distinctly. 
but uh, you know the, actually the, the the crystal field split electron orbital structure of these 4F states is pretty non-trivial. If you've worked with these systems, you probably can imagine. Pardon me, sorry. Uh, yeah, not very far. Uh, uh, so basically, that's some function of basically the instrumental resolution, which blurs things, and also just just uh, Fermi Dirac. Okay. So what you can do, if you want to look a little bit above the Fermi level, is you can just heat your sample up and thermally populate states. Um, of course, that also increases the scattering rate too. But um, that's a, that's a trick we sometimes play is that we'll basically heat it up to you know 100 Kelvin and then basically try to look at some of the states near the Fermi level. But that's basically KT, so it's not, it's not a lot. So we're talking something on the order of you know, a few to 10 milli electron volts. Okay. All right. Okay, any other questions? All right, so I will, um, you, know, uh, you know, so hopefully I, uh, you know, have convinced you that photo emissions are very powerful and, and useful tool for probing these, these correlated quantum materials. So basically has one sort of major Achilles heel that uh, that uh, uh, you know is, is shown here, and that it's extremely surface sensitive. Okay, so so surface preparation is a real challenge. Um, so usually what you do is because you know uh, these are electro this is an electron spectroscopy, so you're very sensitive to the surface. So any adsorbed water, or any crud on the surface will basically completely mess mess up your experiment. So the way we get around this typically, and this is what we did for the uranium or thinium psilocyte in this last slide. So you basically put the sample in a dry vacuum. And then basically you just you just cleave it open, you know, sort of at 10 to the minus 11 torr, just but just before you're about to do the experiment, and expose an atomically fresh surface. Okay, and so this works well for certain materials that cleave nicely, like you know graphite or bisco or bismuth selenide, but not for a lot of other materials. And so you know I found you know it's kind of ironic, right? We have this very sophisticated spectroscopy now. We're basically using like caveman techniques to to prepare our samples. So, uh, so when I got to Cornell a few years ago, one of the, the real efforts that we that we put forth was trying to sort of get around this this issue. Um, so what we what we did at Cornell was we basically developed a, a, a new system that basically is an integrated integrates the growth using oxide MBE. Uh, so these are two growth modules over here with a photo emission system. So we can basically grow all the materials in situ and never have to worry about cleaving. They're basically always clean, and you could just transport them from from one system to another. So this is sort of version 1.0, and we're very grateful. The Moore Foundation just recently um, provided some funding for, for developing sort of a, a next generation, more advanced version uh, of this system. So I think you know a technique like MBE requires like you know Santa Barbara is probably the last place where uh, uh, instruction on MBE needs to be given. So it, you know for the maybe one person in the audience who hasn't heard of it, you can think of it just as atomic spray painting, or you can put down materials with Sort of you know atomic level precision and sort of you know sub monolayer and it's extremely precise, uh, so we can make all sorts of interesting heterostructures or thin films that one may not be able to make in bulk. Uh, this is a picture of the system we have in our lab, so it's hard to see everything with all the cables and, and bellows and transfer lines. But you know here's one growth module, here's another. This is the electron spectrometer and the photo emission system over here. So at this point, you know, I should mention Daryl Sloan was really very instrumental. We worked very, uh, we collaborated very hard on, on, on basically developing this system. And everything you'll hear in the rest of the talk basically is was done in very close collaboration with with Daryl and his group. Probably many of you know him. He's a, one of the, you know, leading oxide MBE people uh, out there. So the way that basically this all works. So here's just, uh, you know, here's a schematic of our chamber of our system again. So the two growth modules, a transfer chamber, and then our spectrometer over here. So what happens is that uh, you know let's say our sample is grown over here. So basically you can see you know there's a, a little uh, sample puck over here. Here's our substrate where we deposit our film, and then basically there's a, a robotic arm over here that comes in and retrieves the sample. Uh, basically you know extracts it, brings it over to this this transfer chamber. So at this point the robot hands it off to like the graduate student. So the graduate student comes in, you know, and then basically uh, transfers the sample. Uh, extracts this little uh, copper puck off this this larger wafer holder and then loads it onto our cryostat. Uh, and this all so this all takes place in ultra high vacuum, sort of 10 to the minus 11, 10 to the minus 10 torr. And uh, obviously this is a, a sped up movie, but you know only by about a, like a factor of five or so. So it actually takes only about five minutes to to shuttle a sample from from here over to here and then you know do our measurements and we can maintain this atomically clean uh, surface. So, you know, using the system, then we can kind of expand the palette of materials that's available to us. So we can go from something just like, you know, typically cleavable, you know, bulk single crystals 
So we've done a, lot, a fair amount of work looking at just bulk materials that wouldn't cleave ordinarily. You just don't have a nice cleavage plane. So some of these materials are like uh, europium oxide and, and strontium ruthenate, which both have interesting magnetic properties. This, these were basically uh, uh, part of a, a Danny Shea's uh, PhD thesis, both, both of these projects. Uh, in addition to bulk, sort of bulk materials that wouldn't cleave, we can also look at uh, metastable phases that aren't available in bulk. They wouldn't necessarily, you know, form a nice single crystal under typical, you know, conditions, let's say, under atmospheric pressure. So one of my students, John Harder, you know, he both uh, grew and did a lot of spectroscopy on this uh, cuprate system, this so-called infinite layer cuprate, where basically uh, it's an extremely simple structure, but, you know, again, this is not available in bulk. And then um, the, the last in, uh, kind of system you can look at are these artificial heterostructures that one can make. Uh, and uh, basically, you know, the system that we've developed, you know, basically allows us to look at all these different kinds of systems. But in the interest of time, I'll just tell you about, you know, one of these little bubbles. So uh, we've been spending a, uh, sort of making, I guess I would say, just really what are just our first baby steps into trying to explore uh, these sort of artificial heterostructures of correlated materials and trying to see, you know, if we can, you know, learn something about the interactions in, in, in these materials in addition to sort of, you know, more bulk-like materials. And, um, you know, so I just showed this a little earlier. So basically, in addition, you know, in these bulk materials, you have a great deal of tunability. But then, you know, at these interfaces now, you know, you can use all these games that, you know, people here at Santa Barbara have used for many years where you basically, you know, you know have broken the symmetry at the interface, you know, lowered the dimensionality, et cetera, et cetera. So you, can, you have all these additional knobs that you can turn to, to control things. Uh, so this part I'm about to move into sort of, you know, more uh, uh, of the technical, you know, uh, specific examples of what we've been doing with this. Uh, are there any more questions uh, on, the, on the first part of this talk that maybe I could answer at this point? What about most of the most of the results you showed were things that you might call metals, even though they were bad metals. Mm -hmm. What about insulators, say mod insulators? Yeah, so actually my, my PhD thesis was mainly studying mod insulators. So, so those would be studied as well, even though Yeah, it actually depends. Yeah, yeah. So that actually that's very interesting. So if you study uh, mod insulators, so so one of the things that uh, that we've worked on were, were uh, you know, basically parent, for instance, cuprates, which are, you know, charge transfer insulators, even though DFT pr predicts them to be metals. So you basically see a, you know, basically what well, looks like an insulator, and, you know, the, the band is renormalized by about a factor of 10 from what you'd expect from DFT. You can see basically the back folding due to the magnetic, the, the, the onset of long-range magnetic order. So you can look at insulators, um, provided that they're kind of slightly kind of leaky insulators or you do them at high temperatures where there's some small amount of free carriers. The, the trick to the experimentally is that we're pulling electrons out, off the sample. So if your material is a very, very good insulator, it will just start to electrically charge up if you have no way to replenish the electrons that flow back in. So we've been starting to try to play games for looking at insulators where you grow a very, very thin insulator, insulating layer on top of a doped either a dope semiconductor or a metal, so you can basically replenish the electrons. But uh, in principle, yeah, so you can look at things like charge transfer insulators, mod insulators, you know, that was something I did a lot in single crystals when I was uh, uh, working more on single crystals. Any other uh, questions? Okay, so everything was, was crystal clear, right? Okay, <laughs> yeah, I don't believe that. Okay, so, um, you know, so, so, People have found, you know, in conventional semiconductor systems that, you know, you can just do a vast amount of stuff just by controlling the electron density and dimensional confinement in conventional semiconductors like silicon and gallium arsenide. And this has had, you know, obviously tremendous scientific and also technological, you know, impacts on, on our society. And so what I want to argue is that, you know, you can imagine now with these more complex materials, you have additional sort of uh, knobs at your control. So you can now you know, change the strength of the interaction or the mass of the carriers or magnetic interactions. So there's a great, you know, degree of more tunability that, that one can, that one can uh, explore. So, you know, if conventional semiconductors are Lego blocks, right? So, you know, you can make some kind of heterostructure like this, then probably carrying this analogy a little further than it deserves to be carried. But, you know, let's say, you know, here are Lego blocks that are, you know, correlated quantum material. So now, you know, you put another block on top, but then actually now something, you know, magically appears in between, right? So basically one plus one is three. You, you get something kind of interesting and emergent, let's say, at the interface between two of these correlated materials. Uh, this is a pretty famous example of this, um, probably the best known one, at least in the field of oxide interfaces. This is the interface between strontium-titanium-O3, and if you deposit a few unit cells of lanthanum aluminate on top, 
basically what uh, Harold Huang and Akira Otomo found a few years ba uh, back, is that the interface has some interesting properties. So they first found that it was a 2D electron liquid, even though both the constituents are non-magnetic insulators. And then they later found that it was superconducting. Actually, this was work from uh, Jean-Marc Truscon and, and Jochen Mannhardt uh, in, in Geneva and in Augsburg. And actually, even more interesting was that the, because some of you might know that actually strontium titanate can be made superconducting. But the actually interesting thing about, um, uh, even more interesting thing about this interface is that people later found that it was actually ferromagnetic. And that's actually really surprising, because you can torture strontium titanate, lanthanum titanate all you want, and it's very, very hard, or almost impossible to make it magnetic. So there's something that, you know, is actually new and emergent at this interface that, um, you know, wasn't there in, in, in the bulk uh, compounds. Yeah. Yeah. Can that, you give us sort of a perspective okay. on the field of how sure the magnetic experiment? Okay. Do you have like about two hours? <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, just to, to give you sort of a very, very brief synopsis. And I'm, a, I'm actually not working directly on this project, so I can give you probably a less biased view, is that there's been a lot of controversy as to what the origin of this 2D electron gas is. So the people have ar argued it could be due to sort of, you know, uh, lanthanum interdiffusion, oxygen vacancies, which are very n known to be prone, uh, strontium titanate is very known to be prone to oxygen formation of oxygen vacancies. The most sort of elegant hypothesis that a lot of people like is this polar catastrophe, is that basically this is a polar material, and basically to negate the polar catastrophe, you transfer charge and you form this 2D electron gas. Um, I would say probably the reality situation is that there are probably elements of all of them uh, at play, but I think the idea is that I think the, the, the general idea that this, you need this uh, kind of a polar interface seems to be uh, robust. Uh, so there are oxygen vacancies that, that are reformed, but people have tried to control that. Um, the ferromagnetism seems to be robust. There's been a lot of groups now that have reported this on samples grown using different methods. And there's been people that have found that the magnetism lives in little puddles. Um, so basically what they think is that there's little patches that form local moments. And then uh, there's other areas that are superconducting. So they're kind of macroscopically separated in, in real space. So it's not a, a homogeneous coexistence of ferromagnetism and superconductivity. But yeah, you know, so this is this is uh, uh, you know uh, I would say just a very kind of you know small summary of a much more complicated and involved uh, field. All right, so you know actually for some of these reasons we've stayed away from that system. So we're looking at a couple other different systems. So one is. Uh, the super lattices of lanthanum manganite, lanthanum manganite and strontium manganite. And then uh, also we've done some stuff on very thin lanthanum nickelate. If I have time, I'll talk about this at the end. But for now, I'll just focus on this. Um, so uh, this is a TEM micrograph from David Muller at Cornell, who's you know, really one of the world experts in TEM. And so basically, you know, he and his graduate students were able to do this wonderful, elementally resolved uh, 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 TEM stem eels map of these super lattices, the blue is our substrate, the red blocks are basically the, the strontium manganite, the green blocks are the lanthanum manganite, and you can see each of the little dots is one, one individual atom column, and you have these very nice um, chemically abrupt uh, interfaces. And you know, of course, all of our samples look exactly like this. You know, if you have, if you believe that, then you have no problem with the rest of the talk. Um, so anyway, yeah. So so, but you know, we we're able to make you know fairly good um, um, super lattices, and then. What we are interested in is basically controlling the separation between these interfaces and seeing what was happening, and then using photoemission to look at actually what was going on. So again, this is sort of a cartoon of the system. So again, we're studying a lanthanum manganite, strontium manganite super lattice. Uh, the particular composition that we're interested in has basically twice as much lanthanum manganite as strontium manganite, so it's, a, it's in a two to one ratio. That's not in, incredibly important for this particular talk. It just happens to be a composition we, we picked for a number of reasons. Uh, in bulk, both of the constituents are antiferromagnetic insulators. Okay, so they're, they're basically uh, both antiferromagnetic insulators. And then, if you just randomly dope lanthanum magnet with strontium, then eventually you can make it conducting and ferromagnetic. And so, what people had found, uh, uh, you know, before we started working on this, was that th depending on how thick you made the individual slabs, if you kept this overall two-to-one ratio fixed, but you just made the slabs thicker and thicker you could basically change the properties. And it was not entirely understood what was, what was driving this. Uh, I should mention that the, the real key person involved in these measurements was my student, Eric Monkman, who's just about to graduate. And this was a, a big part of his thesis work. 
So, okay, so we can, so let's look at some different super lattices of lanthanum manganate and strontium manganate. That's shown here. The lanthanum is green, the strontium is yellow. So, uh, so we have an N equals one super lattice, which is basically one strontium manganite and two lanthanum manganites, or an N equals two, which is four and two, or an N equals three, which is six and three. So stoichiometry is fixed, but you're just changing the separation between the interfaces. Um, so you can ask first what happens if you just randomly scramble up all the cations. If I just randomly, you know, jumble up all the lanthanum and strontiums, it turns out the material is basically a, a metal, you know, not a fantastic metal, but it's a metal, and this, this little kink here is where this material has its Curie temperature. Um, if you look at this N equals one super lattice, it actually, the, the resistivity acts very similar to that of the, uh, of the random alloyed system. And that's actually not so hard to imagine because, you know, if you think of the sort of the Thomas Fermi length in these materials, it's something on the order of about a unit cell. So even though you can make the material, let's say, chemically uh, abrupt, electronically it's, you know, still, let's say, fairly homogeneous if these interfaces are not too far apart. Okay, so now when we get to N equals two, now the interfaces are getting a little bit further apart. The resistivity is, you know, qualitatively pretty similar. It's a little bit higher. Uh, you know, that might just be because, you know, if you think of, you know, the, in the bulk of these, in the middle of these things, these things may still want to be insulators. You know, it's just the interfaces that might be metallic. So, you know, the less, less fraction of the material is sort of metallic. It's sort of a very naive view take on this. And of course, you'd expect this just to continue, you know, indefinitely. But actually what happens for N equals three is that it actually becomes insulating at low temperatures. And then I'm not showing four, five, and six. We've done, you know, we've done those and, you know, they become actually, their, their orders of magnitude more insulating. So, you know, we were interested in basically what was going on, what was driving this kind of behavior. Uh, people that had just done transport measurements on, on this, you know, weren't you know, entirely sure uh, what was, what was uh, the reason for this. Um, so I'll start off just by describing what happens at a single interface between lanthanum manganite and strontium manganite. So there's just a tiny bit of, like, chemistry here, hopefully you'll forgive me. Uh, you know, but it's just at the level that I know, so it's not so bad. Uh, so, you know, lanthanum manganite, there should be four, uh, manganite should be three plus, so there should be four D electrons. In strontium manganite, they're basically 3D electrons. So in strontium manganite, you, these 3D electrons you know, occupy these, these states here. The 3D states are split because of the crystal field uh, uh, um, splitting because the manganese is no longer in a perfectly spherically symmetric environment. It's living inside this octahedral cage. So here are you know, our manganese, uh, you know, three manganese, what we call T2G electrons. And in, in lanthanum manganite, we put one more electron in. It goes up here due to Hunt's rule coupling. And you know you can notice that both of these have an odd number of electrons uh, in in these in these states. So you might think of okay, the odd number of electrons, usually you get a metal. Turns out due to correlations, these are both insulators, and they both sit on opposite ends of this phase diagram. So over here, this is a you know uh, an antiferromagnetic insulator, you know lanthanum manganite in bulk, and strontium manganite over here is also an antiferromagnetic insulator. So now you know if we plot sort of the you know electron density, or let's just say the the you know the number of E.g. electrons as a function of position, you know, obviously it'll, it'll drop. But of course, in reality, this, 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 this interface will not be perfectly sharp. The, the electrons will want to spread out to minimize free energy. So, you know, what's interesting now is that you have this region where there's some kind of, you know, intermediate valence or in, intermediate number of electrons. And so, you know, in, one, in a one electron picture, you know, you'd think, okay, that should be a metal. But in these correlate systems, they, you know, it has some, you know, intermediate electrons. It can it kind of explore this unusual phase diagram. So, you know, this, the, these interfacial electrons might want to be a ferromagnetic metal, but they might also want to be a charge-ordered insulator, right? So all that, all that, all that kind of physics is built into the, into, the, into, the, into the physics of these manganites. So we can do spectroscopy and basically look at what's happening at these interfaces. So uh, I'm going to start again with these metallic, fairly short period super lattices. For n equals 1, basically you see that so this is this, this structure over here. You can basically see a nice Fermi surface uh, topology. So you see these kind of big squares here, and there's a little box in the center. That's more or less what you expect from theory. These, these large outer sheets are primarily dx squared minus y squared, and these are primarily dc squared in character. <coughs> and then for n equals 2, which is also metallic, you know, they look also qualitatively pretty, pretty similar. Okay, so you still see this, this Fermi surface with these two sheets. Now, N equals three, of course, is an insulator. Insulators shouldn't have Fermi surfaces. So, you know, what you find is that, you know, you don't really see much at the Fermi level. We've, I've blown up the, the intensity here by about a factor of 100, just so you see anything at all. If you look at it on the same scale, it basically just looks black. Does it matter what the determinant is? Oh, yeah, that's, that's a really important question. Um, and 
The answer is qualitatively no, uh, but the details can matter quite a lot. Um, and so we, one thing is that the, you have to make, take care of making sure the entire structure is not polar. So it's inver basically the entire structure is inversion symmetric. So what we do is we start with strontium manganite and we end with strontium manganite on top. And the reason we end with strontium manganite on top is that uh, it's, it's the thinner of the repeats and we have to kind of look through, photo emission is very surface sensitive, so we have to kind of look through this cap of stuff on top because we want to get at the interface. And what we find is that when we make the, that, that, that topmost layer or top, topmost cap part too thick, then you don't really see, you know, the, the intensity basically goes down exponentially. Yeah. And the surface is the extraction Yeah, okay, so these are, these are, these are very, really good questions. Um, so we find that actually on the strontium manganite surface there are some reconstructions. Um, but actually it turns out that we, if we term it with lanthanum manganite, which we've done, you also you get a different set of reconstructions. But the, this qualitatively looks like it's basically the same. And we also have uh, we also co uh, uh, corresponded this uh, the, the measurements to they they relate very well to what you see in bulk transports. So if you take it above the Curie temperature, you see different changes depending on what the the repeat is. So we think it's probably not just you know a surface layer effect. Um, also that the the topmost layer is an insulator, and so we're seeing seeing, seeing states near the Fermi level. So we think you know basically they are coming from the interface. Um, Okay, so what's interesting is if we look below the Fermi level, then you know we saw something quite surprising. So here we see all the bands, you know, as they're approaching the Fermi level. That's not a big surprise for n equals one and two, but for n equals three, we see something that looked really similar to n equals one and two. So something we call like a remnant Fermi surface. Uh, you know, it looks basically like what you see in the metallic compounds, even though this is an insulator, right? And so I'll remind you what you would expect to see in a band insulator. You expect to see all the bands folded back upon themselves, you know. This look, basically looks like the Fermi surface is basically, you know, kind of approaching the Fermi level and just gradually disappearing, vanishing as you approach the Fermi level. Um, so if we look at energy versus momentum, basically we get a similar story. So for n equals one, you see these metallic bands as they're approaching the Fermi level, and same with n equals two. And n equals three, yeah, you can basically see these bands, and they're basically still approaching the Fermi level, but they're just kind of petering out as, as you reach the Fermi level. Right? And that's very, very different from what you expect a band insulator to do. You know, just a cartoon, you know, a band insulator should do something like this, right? There should be a fully occupied valence band, you know, um, you know which is what we see in, you know, typical, let's say, stoichiometric mod insulators. Um, so actually, it turned out this was very reminiscent of, of a lot of other systems that exhibit what we know to have uh, nanoscale charge order and, 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 and spin ordering. So this, this kind of uh, spectra look very similar to something I measured, uh, you know, a few years back when I was looking at underdope cuprates in graduate school. So we know that in this particular material, people have seen, uh, actually, uh, uh, this is from Seamus Davis's group at Cornell, uh, basically a, a short-range checkerboard charge ordering that occurs on the surface, and the and the manifestation of these sort of these bands that get gapped out as they approach the Fermi level was an impact of this this charge ordering that happens uh, right near the surface. Um, we can also look at what happens. You could actually also reduce the dimensionality. You know, what we're doing here is basically reducing dimensionality, right? As we're, we have these interfaces, and we're basically just moving them further and further apart from one another. So they're talking less to one another. So they're going from more 3D to more 2D over here. And so, you know, n equals one is the most metallic. That's the green guy over here, and then over here it starts getting insulating. And for other ones, it's even more insulating. It turns out that you could actually make crystal uh, 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 compounds that actually have a, can, can do a, sort of a similar thing, but not in as, uh, as, as in a fine a fashion as we could do with these interfaces. So here we have this cubic manganite here. That was this white one that I discussed a little bit earlier. You can make one that's a, a little bit more two-dimensional than this. So you can make one that's a so-called bilayer system, where you basically have two manganese oxide, uh, a manganese oxide bilayer, and then a, an interrupt, and then another bilayer, another interrupt. So basically, electrons can jump, you know, hop around this bilayer, but it's a little bit harder to go from bilayer to bilayer. <clears throat> and this one is this curve over here. So that's a bad metal. People know, see, have seen that this is very, very close to some kind of uh, charge and spin ordering instability that actually gives rise to this sort of bad metal behavior. And then, actually, in the most 2D limit, you can make ones, make materials that just have a single manganese oxide sheet uh, per unit cell. This is the most 2D, 
And these guys have such strong tendencies towards charge and spin order that they're always insulating. No matter what number of holes you put in, these holes basically want to phase separate and, and basically form insulating uh, ground states. And people have actually looked at you know, comp compounds like this, and they see things that are very reminiscent to what we see in these, in these super lattices. So we think that we're kind of exploring the same phase space of basically dimensionality that we know is a very important kind of tuning parameter to tune between, let's say, metallic or charge-ordered or spin-ordered ground states in, in materials like manganites. So this is some work people did on this insulating 214 compound where they don't see any weight near the Fermi level. But if you look below the Fermi level, they again see something like this remnant Fermi surface that I showed you a couple slides ago. OK, so got a couple minutes left. So, um, so you know, basically, th these were kind of the first experiments people had done in using photo emission to look at these sort of artificial o correlated oxide heterostructures. So we're kind of, like I said, we're still kind of making our baby steps and trying to figure out what's going on. And I think hopefully just scratching the surface of what, uh, what can be done. Um, I'm going to switch gears and just briefly talk about some other work that we've been doing where we're working at, looking at another system, which is Lanthanum Nicolo 3, and we're going from making it you know, uh, relatively thick, you know, 50 or 100 unit cells. And those systems, they're basically metallic. But then what we found is that when you make them very thin, below two unit cells, they, they very abruptly become uh, insulating. So this, this work was just, uh, I guess it's just, just out online now. <clears throat> um, so the key people involved here were uh, uh, Phil King, who is a, just a fantastic uh, Cavalry postdoc that was in my group until a couple months ago. He, he now has his own group at St. Andrews University. Uh, Masaki Uchida, uh, who is a JSPS postdoc fellow, also very, very talented. Now he's uh, uh, on uh, assistant professor at University of Tokyo, and a very good graduate student, Hao Fei Wei, who is uh, helping Phil and, and Masaki. So the material I showed you was lanthanum nicolate. This material is a metal at all temperatures. But it turns out by just uh, uh, tweaking things a little bit, so by, for instance, changing the, the rare earth cation radius from lanthanum to something else, uh, it, that's basically changing the, the, the unit cell, OK? Because the, that's basically, the, they're all trivalent, but these are just different ionic radii. Then you can basically go from being a metal to an insulator. So it's kind of sitting on this boundary between being uh, a metal and an insulator. <clears throat> Um, so this idea behind these metal insulator transitions, these nicolates, were actually, so the work that we did here was largely inspired by actually a lot of work that was done here in Suzanne Stemmer's group looking at ultra-thin nicolate films. So she was one of the first to discover this, this transition when you make the films very thin. And also John Mark Triscone's group in Geneva and a couple others, you know, so this is pretty well reproduced. So uh, again, we wanted to kind of understand what was happening when you made these materials super duper thin. So uh, as I showed you a little bit earlier, this, this is the material that I showed maybe uh, you know, near the first part of my talk. It has a very, very large mass renormalization. So basically, you know, the effective mass enhancement is something like a factor of seven. So we know that the electron correlations are very strong. This thing is sort of on the, on the brink of you know, being an insulator. Um, and so what we can do is we can basically look at what happens to this band as we make the, the material thinner and thinner and thinner. <coughs> Sorry, I'm losing my voice. So uh, this is transport measurements that we did on, on the same samples where we did our, all our spectroscopy. So you know, at 50, 25 unit cells, they all look like just the very, very thick films. You know, eight unit cells actually looks very qualitatively similar to the, to the data I showed you a little bit earlier. And we can just go from you know eight to, to five to four to three, and really not a lot is changing. You know, qualitatively everything looks really similar. We were pretty surprised. We thought we'd see a fairly gradual transition. So it's just kind of just between three and two, there's a very abrupt transition. You can see this band changes dramatically. The, the peaks blow out in, in energy, so they become much broader, much more scattered. And then eventually at one unit cell, basically, uh, you don't see any weight near the Fermi level. This thing is kind of way up here. It's, it's much more insulating. Uh, you, see, you see spectral weight down here, but nothing right near the Fermi level. Um, so you know, we thought, OK, well, maybe this is just purely due to localization. So we are looking at. If we look at the momentum width of a lot of these, these features, you know, basically if you get delta k, that gives you, you, know, you, you invert that, you get a mean free path. And what, you're, what you can see here, this is kind of blown up, but basically the, the, the peak widths of the two unit cell that are insulating are not really any larger than the other you know, five or eight unit cell samples. So the mean free path seems to be pretty independent of thickness. So it doesn't look like at least it's just a, a very simple kind of you know, Anderson localization sort of picture. Instead, what's happening here is that the, the peaks are really becoming, you know, they're, we have these sharp peaks, you know, where the materials are metals, and they're, they're kind of 
you know, this, this what we call quasi-particle residue. But then when we make it very, very thin at two unit cells, this peak basically just disappears. So if we plot this quasi-particle residue, um, you know, we call it Z prime because we can't, it, it's sort of within some multiplicative factor. Then, you know, basically uh, it kind of takes a nosedive when you go between three and two unit cells. So basically these quasi-particles, these well-defined quasi-particles are kind of losing their integrity as you go between three and two unit cells. No, yeah, so they're, they're uh, um, at, at three unit cells, they're not, they're not like 10, I forget what they are, I think they're, uh, yeah. Yeah, so it turns out that um, the, where we see this metal insulator transition is actually quite a bit thinner than, uh, it's about, I, I, I think it's on the order of about a, a few, Hundred, uh, maybe a thousand ohms per square. I think at around three. Hmm? I think at, I think it was at four or five. I believe. I mean, you, as you as you can see, you know, well, that's, it, it's still it's still there's still a fair amount of, of dependence here. There's still a, a fair amount of uh, a dependence here on thickness as you're going from 25 to. Yeah, let me, let me, actually, I have that slide, so let me, let me pull it up. Uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I have that somewhere down here. Let me, uh, just so I don't have to rely on my memory. Yeah, okay, well, you know, this, here, here. So it's, yeah, so here we go. So it's ohms per square at about, uh, so three unit cells is like, you know, 2,000 or something like that. Yeah, at two unit cells, it's, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, but if we look at the, uh, uh, for instance, you know, the mott yolfi regel uh, criterion, right? We're still, actually, if you, you know, we work it out, we're, we're still a little, quite a bit below that if, we, if you actually compare, you know, the mean free pass that we extract spectroscopically from, from transport, so. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think that, oops, hold on. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure my computer is very happy right now. <laughs> hmm. Sorry, you, sorry. Uh, you said. No, no. What? Ten, what? Pardon me. It, it, it's like it's like uh, minus four. Let's see here. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, that's that's what I was showing you down 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 at the bottom because. My ability to multiply numbers, you know, exponentially decreases the closer I get to the board. <laughs> um, yeah, but yeah, but those are the numbers. Those are the numbers there. So, all right. So, uh, but yeah, the the mean free path doesn't seem to be changing significantly. Yeah. So basically, the quasi-particle coherence is take, coherence is basically taking a nosedive right around here. And so, you know, we kind of maybe thought to put this in context with some of the stuff people have been doing in other, uh, uh, other groups. So it turns out that um, uh, 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 Bernhard Keimer's group at Max Planck and Stuttgart have been making these nicolate super lattices. And what they find is that uh, when you go, when, when the, so it's a little bit different than what we're doing, which is just a single film. But basically here, when they basically make uh, a super lattice and then nicolate, uh, layer inside is less than, is two unit cells or less, it's insulating, if they make it thicker than two unit cells, like three and four, it, it becomes uh, metallic, and they argue this is due to the formation of a, a spin density wave that forms in that, in that, in that material. Um, we know that the, a lot of these low dimensional nicolates are also right on the border of being, you know, uh, charred or spin ordered. And there's actually quite a bit of theoretical work that suggests that, you know, 
possibly due to things like enhanced nesting. So this is work from Andy Millis. This is work done here in Leon Valencia's group that when the dimensionality of these nicolates is made to be very low. So here they actually do it in layers, and here they just do it in sort of anisotropy in the hopping parameters, that basically there might be some kind of tendency towards some kind of spin density wave formation. Uh, so kind of a very heuristic cartoon picture that we sort of came up with is that sort of at three unit cells and below, above, basically the material is kind of a strongly interacting Fermi liquid. But at two unit cells, you know, maybe there's some kind of really enhanced tendency towards some kind of ordering. Uh, and maybe the fluctuations are, you know, smearing out our, 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 our spectra in, in energy. And then at one unit cell, it's kind of anyone's guess. Uh, you know, might be, might be, uh, there might be long range order if there's coupling to the substrate, et cetera, et cetera. So you know, that's sort of the, the kind of picture we've come up with where, you know, it's sort of just, you know, at a sort of very, very sort of unit cell level, you can really play with all the different kind of states in this, in this system. So I guess with that, I think I'm out of time. So, you know, basically just to recap, you know, I told you about angle resolve photo emission and how we can use that to probe different kinds of many body interactions in these materials. Um, and then some of the sort of technical advances, you know, in terms of instrumentation that we were able to, you know, allow us to look at a much wider variety of, of, of correlated materials. And then finally, just a couple examples of what we've been doing with these, you know, artificial uh, electron, uh, correlated electron heterostructures. And so I'd finally like to leave off um, by, uh, you know, obviously thanking the agencies that fund the work, um, and also particularly the people involved. So. Uh, uh, Eric Monkman, uh, John Harder, and Danny Shea were my first graduate students. So we, they basically, you know, pretty much, the, the four of us pretty much built all the instrumentation up from, from the ground up. Uh, you know, all the, 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 the work, you know, that I showed you in the last part, of course, was done in very close collaboration with Daryl Shlom and his group. Um, and then Phil King uh, and Masaki and Hal Fay grew all the samples and did all the measurements for the, the nicolates. So with that, I'd like to stop and thank you for your attention.